This is part six in a series of videos in which I'm attempting to repair and restore this Kremenko System 3. So far I've got as far as going through the power supply and the chassis, sorting out a few issues here and there, resolving a few faults on the boards. I've now got all the boards refitted and what I want to do in this video is see if we can actually get the system to boot up. Now the way I've got the cards configured at the moment it will not automatically try to boot onto the floppy it will boot into the RDOS system that's the resident monitor on the uh, floppy drive controller card and we should then be able to control the unit through the remote terminal it's connected through the serial port and I'm using hyper terminal to um, control this what I can do at the moment is slide the electronics box most of the way back in and then we'll be able to see the um, uh, Jade bus probe display and that'll give us some idea as to what's going on so I'll just slide this back in won't go all the way of course because the Jade bus is uh, poking out a little bit but uh, what we now have is uh, the visibility of the uh, Jade bus display so I'll just move the camera slightly and as usual I'll put the terminal up in the corner of the screen and I'll boot up the System 3 and I'll hit the return key a few times on the terminal and it should uh, cause the system to uh, start communicating with the terminal. So as you can see it's booted into the C1000 address block and that's where it's currently executing code so this um, is showing us that code has been executed in that small block of um, memory occupied by the ROM on the floppy drive controller card. We should now be able to use the terminal to control the system through the um, RDOS monitor. So we'll look at the terminal, I'll bring it up to full screen and so I'll hit return a couple of times And you can see we've now booted into the RDOS 1.3 resident monitor. And we can do various things in here. The monitor is actually quite a nice little monitor program. Let's just do various things. So, for example, we can display a memory area. And in this case, if we display the memory at C1000 and we use a block of a 100 hex bytes, then we can see this is the data we're getting here. So if I now bring over the screen from my ROM writing program and I currently have open the ROM image that I took from this card we can see that the values in the ROM are exactly what we would expect. As I said this ROM in the Kremenko is mapped to C1000 upwards and we can see here that the contents of the ROM exactly match what is being read from the machine so we can be fairly confident that uh, what we're seeing here is actually correct. You can do other things from the RDOS system um, it's fairly simple but it's, it's got some quite nice features but the next one we're interested in is the um, boot option. You can set the switches on the system to automatically try and boot into the floppy drives uh, but I've got it currently set here to not do that it boots straight into the monitor but if we type B and hit enter it will try to boot from the floppy drive and of course nothing will happen at the moment because we don't have the floppy drives plugged in so what I'll do is go back to the bench we'll power down the machine and have a quick look at the floppy drives and see if we can make any progress Obviously we've got as far as this so the next step is to start looking to see if we can actually boot into the CDOS system which is the uh, operating system supplied on the floppy disks. So before we start messing with the floppy disks what I thought I might just try and do is try and prompt it to boot from the floppy drives. Even though the drives aren't here we should see some response on the display and it should jump out of this block of code it should start doing something else so we should see a different pattern appear so I'll just hit the return key which will uh, try and force it to boot from floppy drive and as we can see it's immediately done something different 
So it is looking like it's trying to at least uh, access the floppy drive system. So the next thing to do is to actually get the floppy drive um, back on the bench, have a look at it. I have already been through it and carried out some repairs. So I'll just quickly go over what I've done to the drive so far. Uh, and then we'll try and install them in the machine and see if we can make any progress. So here we have the floppy drive out of this system. These are fairly unusual drives, not your typical 8-inch drive. Uh, very over-engineered. Obviously these were uh, in a lot of ways still prototype systems. And uh, luckily there wasn't too much wrong with this. Um, there were a few dead shorts across the supplies and that was nearly all down to these uh, tantalum caps that are dotted all over the place. So I suspect they'll be giving ongoing problems for a while. Uh, but uh, overall there wasn't too much wrong with the electronics. I have cleaned this uh, quite a bit of course. Uh, and the main thing was the usual uh, sticking of all the uh, mechanical parts. Now in particular one of the weaknesses with these drives is because they don't have the standard uh, eject systems, mechanical eject systems, uh, they have this arrangement, this motorised arrangement for loading the head, uh, or rather loading the uh, drive. So this effectively uh, replaces the big lever that you normally have on the front of the drive and then you have a head load solenoid. And the problem with this is it means that if there's no power applied to the system uh, or if the system isn't running you get a bit of an issue because if you try to insert a floppy disk into these drives if the drive itself is working it will accept the disk and it will drive the motor to load the disk that is it will kind of close up the uh, the drive around the disk so you can't get the disk back out uh, but if the system that it's plugged into isn't running you can't then get the disk back out uh, because um, it won't accept a command to eject the disk. Uh, and that can cause a problem of course because it means that uh, people are going to want to get their disks out and quite often what happens is they end up damaging this mechanism uh, or at least twisting it to try and get the disk out. And that's what I found with the second drive in this assembly. So this is actually a dual disk drive. It's not two disk drives that you'd normally expect to find in a system like this. It's not a pair. It's actually a dual drive. So it's a single, a single unit. And there's a single drive motor but it's actually two separate disk drive heads. So you've got one each side. Um, but it's a single mechanism. It's not the uh, what you normally expect to see of two side by side. So um, again it's just really duplicating things on the front and back and of course you have just the single drive motor. It does need the bearings changing on this motor which I haven't done yet but it's not too bad, it's relatively quiet, just makes a bit of a whining noise. Um, but almost all the work I had to do on this was just realigning these um, drive mechanisms. It's, the heads themselves weren't too bad, they were in quite good condition. I have cleaned the um, the head surfaces and again these are quite unusual in the way that they work um, but they're very over engineered and sort of very nicely made uh, but the alignment is fairly critical so I've been through that haven't tried it yet I'm hoping that it's actually going to work uh, but I have tried manually driving these using a power supply with it disconnected from this drive just to make sure that it operates over the correct range I've done that on both the front and the rear drive, or left and right drive. And so it's now ready to go back into the machine and we'll see if we can actually get some life out of it. I'll start by taking the Jade bus probe out. We don't need that just now. I might put it back in if we get problems trying to uh, get the drive working. For now we'll get this out of the way so we don't damage it. And then it's a case of manoeuvring the drive into the bay quite a big heavy drive but uh, as I said it's an unusual drive in that it's uh, two drives in one assembly so it does make it a big heavy drive and also if you get problems uh, it can be a bit uh, difficult trying to sort them out. But, uh, we'll lift that into place and I'll just move the camera along so you can see what I'm doing. Okay I doubt you'll be able to see this very well but the first thing we have to do is connect the mains cable and that goes into a socket on the rear bottom of the drive. 
Uh, we then have the floppy drive cable. It's not long enough to plug in until you push the drive all the way in. So we'll get that connected. And I'll move the camera back a bit further. And then we have the main power connector. And then finally, this connector goes onto the small power supply board. Okay, so that's now we've got the drive reconnected. What we should be able to do now is see if it will attempt to boot from the drive and see if the drive is actually triggered. Okay, so looking back at the front of the drive, as I mentioned earlier, unlike most drives, we don't have the usual arrangement of the eject levers on the front. Everything is driven internally by the uh, solenoid and drive motors and uh, that, as I say, does make it a bit of an issue if um, the system doesn't work because the drive may well take in the disc and then you could have a, a problem getting it out again. So the first thing we'll do is boot up the machine. Um, hopefully it'll come back to life. I haven't tried this yet, so this is a first and um, I have checked for shorts. Um, I've tried applying power to the 5 volt and 24 volt rail from the bench supply and the current drawn seems fairly reasonable um, but this is the first time I've actually tried to drive it from the machine. So what should happen is the main drive motor should um, spin up, that's the mains powered motor. It's fairly noisy and it runs all the time um, but other than that we shouldn't get anything untoward happening uh, and what I'll do then is press the enter key on the terminal a few times and we should get RDOS back up and running. And the way I have this configured is it shouldn't try and boot directly to the floppy drive. I've got it to boot into RDOS and so I'll have to manually tell it to boot from the floppy drive. That's intentional. I don't want the system trying to access the floppy drives at this point. Uh, I don't want it damaging any of the disks or you know, doing anything that uh, I don't want it to. So we'll do it uh, step by step and the first thing now is to get this powered back up. Okay, that well, looks fine so far. Uh, next thing I'll do is hit the um, enter key on the terminal a few times. So as you can see, our DOS is now running. It uh, doesn't seem to have done anything uh, untoward by having the drive plugged in. So what we'll do now is enter B and enter on the terminal. That should cause the system to try and boot from floppy disk but for that to work we need a, uh, a disk in the drive but I don't want to use uh, one of the actual boot disks so I've just got a, a sacrificial disk here so let's pop that into the drive the disk is now in the drive and if I now hit the B key and enter we should hear the drive come to life so I'll put the microphone fairly close to the drive and then go back to the terminal Okay, so as you heard, it's indeed tried to boot from the floppy drive. So the next thing I'm going to do is try to uh, actually boot from one of the floppy drives. So the first thing I need to do is eject the disk. The button on the front uh, of the door that enables us to eject the disk. And then the next thing is to insert one of the actual boot disks. So we'll take the boot disk. Make sure it loads up the way it should. I'll now reboot the machine. That'll take us back into RDOS and I'll try the boot process again. Okay, so I've rebooted. I'll try getting RDOS up and running. So RDOS is now up and running and what I'll do now is press B and enter. Okay, and the system has successfully booted from the floppy disk. Now, these disks are very old and the chances of them working more than once or twice is very remote. So the first thing I'm going to do now that I have um, the CDOS system up and running 
is before I even power the system off and fairly quickly I'm going to make a copy of the disc I've got a brand new disc here uh, luckily with uh, machines like this where we have two drives and I have checked that both drives uh, worked or at least as far as I can and what I'm going to do now is copy the uh, primary disc that's the disc we booted from onto a brand new disc and then we'll use the brand new disc and that will mean that uh, even if we were only able to luckily read that uh, original disc once we should at least have uh, a genuine copy of it and now we can use our brand new copy for all the uh, future testing so I'll insert the copy we've just made and I always recommend that you do that whenever you're working on machines like this you really don't want to destroy the only copy of a disc you might have so first job if you can get the machine to work at all is make a, a copy or several copies of the disc I actually made three copies of this um, and I won't use the original again that'll go back to the owner this is not my machine and so it's up to him what he does with that original disc so we'll power the machine back up we can take our new disc put that into the drive So as you can see it boots successfully from our brand new floppy disk. It seems to be fairly reliable and so in the next video we'll do a bit more thorough testing of it. I get it all bolted back together so it looks a bit more uh, as it should and then we can do the uh, final test steps and make sure it's working. And then once that's been done we'll hook it up to the ADM3A dumb terminal and uh, see how the overall system performs.